2004, approximately 11 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Sure. My name is Edward Abramson. I was born September 21st, 1920, in Manhattan. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I was at uh, NYU and City College for half a year and another half a year, about one year. Okay. Do you remember where you were, how you heard about it, and your reaction to Pearl Harbor? Well, I would be selling newspapers. We had, at that time, we were selling papers at night, and it was on the Sunday. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, when we heard it on the radio, we had to get out to sell papers about two, three hours later, downtown Brooklyn. Well, it was a headline now, so we're going to sell a lot of papers. We didn't know what Pearl Harbor was. We didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor. But we knew that there's going to be a headline, and the headlines meant selling new daily newses. At that time, we would sell it for two cents a piece. We made 60 cents a hundred, or for 140 a hundred. And we figured, well, today will be a good day. We'll make about five, six dollars. That was it. Uh -huh. Do you remember your personal reaction to the news, or? We didn't know where Pearl Harbor that was. Most didn't. They yes. didn't know where it was. Right. Okay. Um, were you uh, drafted, or did you enlist? I was drafted. I came home one day and said, Mom, I received a letter from uh, the President of the United States, and she wasn't too happy about it. Okay. Um, where did you go for your, you went in in November of 42, where did you go for your basic training? I went to, what, what had happened, uh, in December 7th, we, we went in there. We, we went, we were uh, initiated in December, by December 7th, we took the train to Camp Upton. And uh, I'll never forget when uh, my sister and my mother was coming me to Grand Central, and we were taking, going to one little place around the corner, and they expected us to come back. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, we went the other way. When that happened, I met the mom and, and my sister said, Mom, we're open, we're leaving, see. And they, like, they turned around and they asked what had happened. They saw two MPs grab a hold of me on a collar <laughs> and bring me into the train. We came to uh, Camp Upton and we received our shots and we got on the train. And of course, we explained, we uh, checked out the different, uh, uh, the different points we had. I had to uh, same amount of points. We figured, well, we're going to the Air Corps. We wound up at Fort Jackson, Columbia, South Carolina, and we lined up. We figured, well, we're taking a break at the train. We're probably heading towards Florida. And we received, had this colonel in front of us, the microphone, harsh voice, and he eventually was killed. And he said, you know, all you fellas, you're in the infantry, and six months from now, most of you will be dead. <laughs> and we're all looking at each other. About ten days before, we sleep in our home, in our beds, at home. So that's the initial, mm -hmm. that's how we found ourselves in the infantry. Had you ever been away from home up to that point? No, I haven't, no. Mm -hmm. no. I, had, I haven't. Uh, from there, we, well, they brought us into they had the 397th, 398th, and 399th Regiment, the 100th Division. Yeah. And of course, I was assigned to the 100th Division, to the 399th. And then I was assigned to the S3. Never heard anything about the S3. But later on I learned uh, that the S3 was the pulse of the regiment. The Army moves only on on assignments. Uh -huh. The S3 doesn't say a word. The Army doesn't say, keeps quiet. And that's how it works out. We, we, we work from the, from the division to the regiment. And the regiment now, the S3 was operations, consisted of the colonel, full colonel, the major, the master sergeant, Sergeant and myself. These are the fellows. Uh -huh. And one thing about the Germans, they knew that they had to destroy the S3 in order to stop anything from happening for at least eight or nine days till new replacements come in. Uh -huh. And the most important thing, they kept they kept the S3 uh, very tight because they knew they wanted to make experts up from us. And that's what we were. We were experts on the, on the, we knew exactly how to read a map. At the, at the last moment, we had to be done. So we had a, uh, we didn't realize the seriousness of it uh, until we went on maneuvers in Tennessee. And of course we had eight problems, one, one a week. Uh -huh. And we would destroy every problem, well that's fine. We didn't have to wait, we waited for four or five days later for a new problem. Uh -huh. By the time the maneuvers were over in eight weeks, we landed in uh, uh, Fort Bragg. 
that's when we woke up and said, my gosh, hey, I'm so really good. <laughs> hey, time six, hey, out of eight. And uh, just no good. Well, what happened basically, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead of myself a little. During the, after the, we had 175 straight days of fighting there, see. And we had lost two S3s out of three. We were the only one that wasn't destroyed. And one of the things I have to give credit to was the colonel. Uh, the general, we were never under direct fire, but mainly 88s. And it was the way out to try to reach out to us. And we'd be near the heavy weapons. Heavy weapons, you have an A, B, C, D. D would be the heavy weapon. E, F, G, H. H would be the heavy weapon, and so on. We were mm -hmm. three battalions. And uh, what had happened was, we'd be near the heavy weapons. And the thoughts behind that was that the Germans would be afraid of fire to that, in that area, because they would locate okay, where the fire was coming from, and we'd have to depend on the OP's observation of the people. Mm -hmm. But we were able to, they, they, would, they themselves would know where they are, the Germans. So they kept on going, going into rifle companies and going out of our heads. The toughest fighting we had, is the most dangerous as far as we were concerned, was in the Vosges Mountains. And Can I go back a second before you get to that? When, when did you go overseas? All right, we went overseas. Uh, uh, we landed in Marseille, I think October 20th, 1944. Okay. And uh, um, did you go in convoy? Your yes, entire... yeah, we went on trucks. Okay. See, to, we, had, we had to relieve the 45th Division mm -hmm. at Baccarat, France. And uh, we landed, we took us, let's see, uh, the following day, or a couple of days after we landed in Marseille, they gave us our ammunition, grenades, everything else, put us on the trucks, and we went there two nights and three days. And we, now it, it was a big rainy night, and uh, we had to find holes. We took the holes from the 45th Division, see. And here we were laying up the water, was up to our necks, and we're laughing. What are we laughing about? Welker, another one of our buddies, couldn't find a hole. <laughs> it's amazing, sometimes when you think back, you're in the water up to your neck, and you're laughing, see. <laughs> and I'll listen to it. Okay, so, um that was your first combat, then yes. you went into combat That's then, right. and you said how many days did we you? Had about 175 days, right. we, and, uh, and that was the end of it. When the time we took uh, Stuttgart, that was the end, the end of the our fighting. Mm -hmm. Then of course we had our problem with Stuttgart. It seemed that they had the uh, French uh, army, was sort of had an army around, and they had the Senegalese uh, coming to raping their women and they would ask to stop. And if they didn't stop, we were going to have to drive them out. Now here we are, just finished battling, and now we're in a, we're, we're there, now here's a big army, and we have to drive out an army. So they gave the army uh, till 12 o'clock midnight, and they didn't go out. At 6 o'clock, we're going to drive her out. 6 o'clock came, they gave us all our ammunition, and we had to get out, thankfully. <laughs> it was a terrible thing, you know, we had to do. It was like a, a whole army fighting a division. Actually, it didn't work out, so apparently they gave orders for us to get out. And then eventually, when things settled down, they brought us back to Stuttgart. So this was a French? In the French um, army, yeah. Oh. English, African army. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of your uh, combat experiences? Well, uh, <coughs> up to sure. That point? There's one, uh, one, very, one experience that we could never forget. Uh, of course, with the S3, again, we're moving all over Paiste. Now we, we're coming up to Lemberg. This is just at the time, uh, right before the Battle of the Bulge, see, and Lemberg, Germany, and we didn't realize there was going to be some real fighting. So we sent in one battalion, and there were two companies were really hurt badly. Then we sent in another, another battalion on the other side. Before you know, we sent three battalions at one time fighting. And each didn't know where they were. They, and it was amazing because a shell, land, an 88 shell, landed about no more than 10 feet away. And uh, Colonel Tyson and I were on a map together. So the other folks couldn't. See, at the time, when these things happen, when a battle happens, the one who's on the map has to stay there with it. And we stayed there for 48 hours without any sleep whatsoever. 
because the crowd was going on. But what we said at the very end it was all over. After the war was over, we exchanged conversation with Colonel, Colonel Tyson and I, who eventually became a general, Brigadier General. And we said it was so amazing. We didn't care for our lives. We were so concerned only that we shouldn't get killed for the sake of for the men that were out there fighting. It was a psychological thing. It didn't matter about us getting killed. It was a matter that we wanted to stay alive for their benefit. Isn't that amazing? And it was really true. The only ones who could know about it was us, the two, two of us. Very interesting conversation. It was an com interesting conversation we had. Okay. Another area uh, which is very important. My brother and I was in the, he was in the Air Corps, and we met together for a day or two. And he said he's going to, uh, because my mother and father are split, my mom is home alone with my sister, and said he's going to uh, join the uh, volunteer to go to as an air gunner rather than the air radio. Thing. And he went. It was during the All India, All India raids and everything uh -huh. else at that time. And I lost track of him thing, completely. And now we're in our trucks. We're in Marseille, we're in our trucks. It's the last mail call that we would have to up for many. It was the last mail call, see. And there I get a little letter, a small little, a little small six and three quarter envelope. See. And on the corner it had Tech CF Sergeant Irv Abramson, 180 Crystal Street, Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the happiest guys going, as far as I was concerned, that was it. <laughs> the most important thing that happened. Now, a lot of guys were concerned about going to the front, didn't bother me at all because of that letter. Mm -hmm. so, that's something you never forget. Yes, right. <laughs> he was home, and that's all that counted. Another area, uh, you don't forget, after the war was over, we, now we stopped fighting. And now we're, we're in a home, now we're picking up homes now, wherever you are, that's where we're staying. See. And we're hearing that the radio is going, now they're cheering in London, and, and here we're sitting this way, <laughs> as quiet as could be. We never, we weren't able to enjoy that at the same time. Another area was, uh, we had, most of us had one point that we needed, one more point to get home. Couldn't, couldn't get home, 56 points and we load. Most of that, most of us had 55, say, whatever. And now we're coming home. We're coming home and we expect the fans and everything else. We landed in Staten Island and there's one guy in, <laughs> Now, uh, were you ever there for the occupation? No. At all? You well, we were there temp until we, we, when the war was over, we waited a while, and now they could prepare us to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. So we were ready to go to Japan, and then the, the atomic bomb, you heard about that, mm -hmm. the war was over. What was your reaction when you heard about the atomic bombs? We were bombs? glad. We were glad. That we could, couldn't care less about what happened. We were happy that we were coming mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. We were very depressed for a long time. So, you know, after the war was over, here we are, we're this, this little town, a lot of guys were disgusted. And I got a letter from my brother, because I was writing letters home, apparently, and he said, you know, pull the heck out of me. You're alive, if it's all over, you're alive, you're thankful. And I showed it to a lot of fellas, and that sort of helped them out a lot. Mm -hmm. They lost that de depression type of situation. And then you wonder why how guys got, uh, very few guys did the fighting, most of the guys were in the back. They, and uh, you wondered why, uh, how a guy could get in there and uh, be happy. He was in the foxhole. Why? Because he wasn't out on parole, patrol. Mm -hmm. The guy on patrol, you figure, gee, why me? See? And what happened was he was happy that he was on patrol not being dead. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, see? Yeah. Another, another chair. I'm just thinking of a little thing. Right. Yeah. You know. uh, we came in to a field one day, one night, and we were tired, and there was a house, a barn, so we wanted to go in there, and the parents said, no, no, okay. and we moved away about 100 yards away. The INR, the intelligent reconnaissance, came in that night. They were in, the, in that barn. The barn was completely destroyed, they killed them all. Mm. And these little things you remember, my gosh, that, that we really were very thankful uh, that we last and landed that long, that amount of time. Mm -hmm. They had, a, you might have had 103rd, I don't know, you might have some guys in the 130, they were young fellas. They sent them over, didn't even know how to put a round in their, in their rifle. And in two, less than a week, two-thirds of that division, 15,000 men were destroyed. 
So I like to meet guys because we, we, when we were up in Fort Jackson, they were young kids, see? And they were like our sister outfit. We were the hundred, they were the one or third. And so I like to meet them because they would, that, you would hear a lot of stories there on that. Real stories at the top. How they came in, they were destroyed almost immediately and they were captured, everything. Where do you think uh, your most difficult combat was? I, th I think it was, a, it was the Roses because you, had to, you were in the forest and the 88s were coming in. And it wasn't where they were going to land. Mm -hmm. They hit a tree and thousands and thousands of tree bursts mm -hmm. would hit you. And that's where we lost a lot of men in that area. We, they, we, we ourselves didn't know where to go. There was no place to go home and hopefully that we weren't hit by a tree burst. There was no, no shelter, none whatsoever. When they would fire A30, 88s in, in the, at the Vosges Mountains, they have forests here. In fact, when I go to Atlantic City sometime on the road, I'll see a bunch of forest trees. I'll remind myself of that. It's amazing how it stays in your memory. See. Did you have enough uh, personal equipment, plenty of warm clothing or boots? Or? No, we were ridiculous. We had our overcoats. And they never changed anything. When we finally got out, we took our first shower. There was pimples all over the place. So, you know, and there, just living conditions in there was you know, the worst of the worst. There were times I'd be laying in a hole and I'd say, what am I doing over here? <laughs> but the conditions, they, what could they do? Did you suffer from frostbite at all? Well, some guys suffered from that. I say you were very, I was very fortunate. A lot of guys were fortunate, some guys aren't. Did you, that. Ever, did you ever get the winter boots or did you just have the, the regulation shoes? No, we had, we, they gave us boots. You had the boots? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. We had boots, we had, uh, uh, that, that helmet was the best thing. Did everything for me, that helmet. Mm -hmm. That helmet did everything for us. And then sometimes you have your rations. And then when you know, if you broke through the lines, the German lines, then you had a little more freedom, see. But what the Germans would do, they would zero in on a particular area and then leave. And every now and then, they'd log some in there. So it was a matter of, you see a kitchen there. The kitchen would be, consist of a couple of that's it. And you'd cross, but you slip down. <laughs> well, you got up very fast, but you know, they'd be coming in. Uh -huh. Who knows when? See, they would zero in right. could, they, on, on these, in these areas. We lost a lot of men, a heck of a lot of men there. It was something that we initially we never spoke about at the beginning. I think fellows are beginning to talk about it now. See, the, the thing that hurts is we have an organization, the Association, Hundredth Division Association, uh -huh. and what's heartbreaking is you see all these guys taps. The list is going, we're going down the line. See, I, when I turned 80, see, I'm 80, I'm gonna be 84 now, and uh, I was saying no when we joked around with other guys. You know, she's at 79, 8 and 79. And that's bad. Well, that's bad. You notice that we don't find too many 80s. Let's get to that 80s. <laughs> now the guys are in the 80s already. And we're saying, hey, you know, there's very, very few 90s now. Let's get there. <laughs> but these are the type of humor we have. Mm -hmm. And when sometime when you see fellas with, uh, with their family, and you know they were missed by one little shot, that whole family would have been wiped out. Mm -hmm. These are thoughts that you have yes. you know, when you're that close to it. Nobody's a hero. Everybody goes through a mess. Uh, one fellow was driving a truck, and the Howard, his name was right, and he left and he went to, they put him in a rifle company. And all of a sudden we hear him, he's a hero. He got a hold of him one day and said, what happened? He was in, the, in one rifle company, and one of the squads was caught, the Pope Batat, platoon rather, 51 men was, was caught. And he was on the other side, and the machine machine gun was hitting him that way, and they had they didn't, there was no way of getting out of that. In the meantime, they must have spotted him, so they have to take your rod and put it out there and put it in there, so he could have a better leverage. The Germans would have. Mm -hmm. But while they were doing, and now we knew they were going to spot him, and he ran, and as he ran, he tripped, and as he tripped, he threw his grenade, yeah. and he wiped them out. <laughs> it's a hero. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. What were your relations like with the French people? Did you ever have much contact with we the French people? We didn't have much contact mm -hmm. with them. We really didn't. We, we 
felt sorry because we knew there was nothing there. Everything was destroyed. Everywhere we went was destruction. So mm -hmm. Then when the world, when we were on a furlough, we had a pass furlough, uh, you know, a Brussels rather. And for the first time we saw uh, a window. What does a window look like? Mm -hmm. So that's how we were. It was in existence. And when you look back, you don't really not know yet. Oh, I had mentioned this. It's very, very important. We had uh, gone from, from uh, Fortsheim to uh, uh, Stuttgart, to Rome. And as we walk, kept walking, we saw these people. We thought they were prisoners. They were like walking in a trance. See? Just walking, walking. And uh, as far as we were concerned, we were tired ourselves. We kept going this way, they kept coming the other way. See? And then we went a little further, and sure enough, there was a labor camp. There were prisoners coming out of a labor camp. See? Uh, how the infantry works, <coughs> and I'm really leading to this, mm -hmm. how the infantry works is that when the, when the Germans retreat, then we send the cavalry in. And their job is just to continue going after them. And when they stop, then they stop mm -hmm. until the party comes in. See? Well, they when they, they passed over, the cavalry was the first to, to be in that camp. But they didn't know what, what they were. And they kept going. And I was, that camp, the camp was free to, because uh, it was a breakthrough. Right? And then by that time, we were coming in. Well, in Stuttgart, Germany, that's where we were. See? During there's a pass up, there's a, a young Kipper holiday which is coming out right. around, see. And uh, here we had Jewish soldiers and the Holocaust victims who were together for the first time. See. Because no, we couldn't get near them because they were just, just diseased and everything else. So we had orders to keep away from them. They were diseased. And they bring them to camp that way. But when things got better, and we had, by that time, things were getting better, so we were able to get together. I met the sister, uh, met a lady rather, and uh, we were talking Yiddish, see. And uh, she said she came from Paris, from uh, Paris, and uh, her sister, there she knew, said this address. And I told her I was going to Paris for three days, so she, I took her address and I put it in my pocket. And that was the end of it. I'm in Paris now. After two days, I'm going to leave the next morning. And I look in my pocket. There's the address. And I figure I'll throw it away. It doesn't make sense. But I figure, okay, it's in the early in the morning, 10 o'clock. I'm not too far from the place I'll walk. So it's like four or five landings. And then I come doing a neighbor court. And they you know, open the door and I told them, I showed them this. So I think they moved over here. And I spent the day going over one place and finally about one o'clock in the afternoon, I figured this, I couldn't do it. And then it became a challenge after a while. Now I'm going, I'll never forget 12 o'clock midnight. I came out of the underground. And uh, there it was, a big, big light, a uh, big clock, 12 o'clock. And the address was just about, a, maybe about uh, a half a block away, a block. And I went there and I rang the bell. And you could see it, uh, somebody coming, you could see from the door, there's a window on top of the door, there was some light way back there. And they opened the door, one guy opened the door. And I could see a lot of people in the kitchen way back. And uh, so I gave him, the, I told him I gave him the letter, and he ran there, and that scream so great that I didn't, I walked away. Maybe, and I, to this day, I don't know why I reacted that way, and, but I must have been tired, shocked, who knows what it was. See? So I wrote a story on that, see? and I put down, there's a clock by the station, never realizing that there's loads of other clocks <laughs> by the station. <laughs> And that was it. So they found each other. Mm -hmm. And I was never able to find the results of that. See? Mm -hmm. But they had they had the address of her on the other side where she was in Stuttgart. Uh, Thanks, honey. Thank you. Were you um, up to that point? Were you aware? Or were the soldiers aware of, of the no, completely camps un at all? Completely unaware. Mm -hmm. Remember, now all we did was fighting. Right. And there was no newspapers and nothing mm -hmm. that we knew about. What was your general reaction when you saw these people and, and we, found out about this? We felt, we felt very, very bad because we saw we saw the uh, how they looked. They looked like human skeletons, skeletons, really. And, and they they were and then they were treated. Even here, they're now they're they're uh, uh, 
they're freed, but they're freed by tired guys. Mm -hmm. And the only ones that uh, were able to help them were when the Corps came in. Mm -hmm. And they were now able to help them and, and give them the food and everything else. But mm -hmm. there were two groups fighting the, the victors, the, the, the victims, and the ones that helped them, basically. Mm -hmm. Although we never had anything to do with helping them. Mm -hmm. Germans left them, and so they, they came. There was no such thing as Hello Hawaii. Yeah. There, in the days, we initially thought they were prisoners, as I mentioned before. But later on, we realized what they went through. But we had gone through a lot too. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have that understanding too much. We had that understanding as far as but knowing how bad it, bad it was to exist. But we really truly didn't know what was going on until we learned from newspapers of pictures that, we, that were there. Okay. Um when did you finally arrive home? Uh, I came home, let's see, February, uh, the, the middle of February, I think, of 45. Or 46. 46, please forgive me. Sorry, forgive me. Do you recall, um, just going back to when you were in the service uh, in Europe, do you recall your reaction uh, about when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? I guess we were too. It was hardly, you couldn't get any type of reaction from mm -hmm. each of us. Because we're tired guys. Yeah. We we're tired, so we died, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and I was just curious. There was no such. You have to understand that we weren't in the same frame of mind as a civilian. Mm -hmm. We weren't in the same, we weren't in the same frame as fellows who were in the, in the core, at core. They might have read things, but we had nothing to read, we had nothing to see. And, and some died, but we were seeing mm -hmm. all guys dying. Mm -hmm. One thing that struck us, every infantryman knows when to remember the first guy that was killed and his number. McCarthy, 32649520. I don't know my social security number, but I know that. Huh. Just a good way to test them sometimes. Yeah. They're in the infantry. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all our friends, we talk about it. After you uh, were discharged, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? No, I didn't. Uh, I went right to work. Uh -huh. So you I, didn't I, use I ignored the, the 5220. I was going to Two weeks, and that was it. Okay. Because you have to understand there was a breakdown. My parents, and things were pretty rough, depression times. See? And the war was over now, so we wanted now to send money home, real money home, that we weren't able to do our well soldiers. Uh -huh. My mom would get $50. We 26 for the keep and 24 whatever would go to them. So we, it was, a, I guess you, when you think back, uh, I think back it was like a nightmare. We remember seeing one fellow the last time he was in a boat with us on the boat coming over. And then we saw him later on, yeah, six months later, in a sense. And we could never say anything. It was like a nightmare. Just like a nightmare to each other. What happened? I hadn't seen you on a boat since the boat. This we landed in Marseille, now here we are now, in Stuttgart, what's happening, see? It, it's, uh, that's why I think it's, it's good that you're doing something like that. You don't hear that, but you're, it's, it's an everyday, it's the everyday life, like laughing in a foxhole. They have the water, raining, mm -hmm. and you're, what are you laughing about? <laughs> what, you can't find a foxhole to go in there, see? And you still laugh about that, but yet, here we are. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Uh, yes, I joined the uh, Veterans of Foreign War. Okay. Then I got involved in politics. You got married right away, see? and I got involved in politics. I was involved for 40 years in politics, mm -hmm. see? and that uh, kept you away from we, I would, wouldn't join it, but I would have to be involved in speaking in front of groups, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. That's how we met your, uh, our governor. He was just a kid. <laughs> did you, you see him? Oh, did you see him every so often? No. Not uh, that often. Otherwise, I might give him my best. When you okay. Yeah. Um, do you uh, did you ever keep in contact with anyone that served with you? Yes, we have this hundredth infantry division, right. see, and uh, six of us together. We signed corporation papers. Five of us passed away already. I'm the only guy in there, see, and uh, we meet uh, uh, once a year at a convention. At the beginning, I was meeting them, but then after I got so involved in politics, and would come at the time when 
at the primary time. Mm -hmm. We have primary time, so not able to uh, be at the conventions. But we generally would meet a few fellows together. We'd meet them at a restaurant in the city, and we'd discuss things. You know. mm -hmm. And then also we see how old they're getting. Yeah. Some of them have kept crutches, and then all of a sudden you look in the taps, it comes out, the paper comes out three or four times, and I'm going to page like that. These guys are lost. They lose, mm -hmm. We're losing a lot of guys. I don't know whether they realize it or not. Oh, yes. The stage, this, I went to one fellow, and I said, no, this, we were on the front line. This is a real front line. We know we're not coming back. Yeah. How would you uh, say that your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? I don't know if it had an effect on my life. I was very thankful, I think, that I came home alive. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, all the things that might have happened was minor. Most important thing. The bottom line was that I was alive. Mm -hmm. and I was unscratched. See. And thankfully, uh, I was was not able to, to. I was able to get away from the, the things you see, guys without bodies and everything else. Mm -hmm. And it didn't affect me as much as it affects a lot of people. See. Yes. I've seen guys walk shell, shell shocks in like this, in there. Other guys, you know, no legs at all. Uh, one fellow. Legs, everything else. One day we were, walk, we were walking on the. Uh, I was talking to the kids, say, I, I had to leave my the company, I had to go to find a tree, take a leak of it. And uh, now I want to catch up to them. So I said, some, now they're going to go along this way, see. I figured I'm going to have them through there and catch them. And I'm running down on, on, the, on the grass and it was like, stop. I realized it could be a minefield. Mm -hmm. Well, it took me maybe an hour. A little part to catch up to them. What <laughs> looking for a step, like a step on me. <laughs> we had a lot of incidents. See that came and go, came and go. Did you get to see any USO shows while you were over there? No. no. We went from from Marseille right into combat. Mm -hmm. Stayed there for a few days and into combat, continuing on to Stuttgart, and the thing was over. We, there was no such thing as uh, we, maybe we stopped fighting for maybe a couple of days here and there when there's a breakthrough. Okay. New Year's Eve, all right, it's Christmas for New Year's Eve, 44, right? We were right under the bulge, after throwing the bulge, and it went to Watson. And uh, what happened? Shells stopped to come in. So we thought it was our artillery. Don't pass us. Uh -huh. What are they doing? They're drunk and they're hitting us. We didn't realize that they're hitting. It was the Germans, see. And the Hun 17th, and we came in, wherever we were, we dug holes right away, immediately. See? Even the colonel was digging holes, so what do I say? And uh, the artillery, the, the cavalry rather, never dug holes, they, they never were in the front, yeah, so they were able to get onto their trucks. Well, the Germans apparently knew it, and they broke through that line. And that line was through the area where they protected us at that time, that, that evening. And now we know it's about six in the morning, holy mackerel, the breakthrough is gone. We're, we have, there's nobody in front of us. So we made that quick trip out of get the S3, went along a particular ridge, we landed into another part of the country. And we were trapped. They called on the 36th, that's a Texas division. They saved our life. They really had a, they had a uh, 24, 36-hour walk, you know, and they finally broke the lines and they saved us. Otherwise, we'd be captured in another one week. So I have to say, Texas is for me, 36. So I find a couple of guys from the 36. See, so because sometimes you can tie in some of these stories. You know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they made that forced march to help us. They really were tough guys. Uh -huh. 36 and the 45th, they were tough. Could you show, hold that photograph oh, up sure. and show, uh, thank you. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Yes, you can focus right in. Uh, where and when was that taken? Uh, this was in Paris. The war was over. Mm -hmm. It was in Paris on the way to London for a 10-day holiday. And we stopped in Paris for a day or so on the way. Okay. Now you're finding out some stories, Gloria. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you. Take care.